or some of the attributes of a finite state machine. Yeah. So, uh, so, so again, so again. Okay. So there's states. How many states? Are there an infinite number? Finite number, and how do you transition between states? So there are transitions, but what causes the transition? Yeah, some symbol in your language. You have a, a finite set of symbols, like the ASCII character set. You have a finite number of states, and then you transition between those states by reading input characters. And this is you know, a very abstract model of, of string pattern matching, but we saw last time that this can be used for all sorts of applications, like in video games or in vending machines. Uh, it's, a, it's a simple model of computation that if you can translate your problem into that model, well, there's already a bunch of uh, tooling and con a conceptual framework for solving that. You don't have to sit down and write a program with a bunch of if statements and while loops. You can just write a regular expression and you'll get this, this machine that will process, that, that will solve that problem by processing the input. Okay, we have this homework, which probably is a little tedious, going through and very carefully uh, generating this DFA from a regular expression. Um, so questions on that. And so remember, we're grading for, you know, if you showed a concerted effort, but you're not 100% correct, that's okay. You'll get the grade. But I just want you to kind of experience kind of a discrete light to go through the process of doing this translation. It also is a kind of compiler. It shows you how you have to think about every possible input to your machine in order to do these translations. So questions about that, that process, that translation process from the regular expression to DFAs. Everyone feel like they got the right answer? Who got the right answer? Okay, so maybe a half or so. Who feels like they totally botched it? Okay, so not, not too bad. And then most of the other people, I guess, are in the middle, middle somewhere. Um, but it's okay, but yeah, yeah. That's right, yeah, that would be like the air state, yeah. You don't have to, you can, you can do that, you don't have to. Because ultimately when you make the table, all of the entries that are absent, that you don't have a transition to, those are the air states. So you could do that. And another kind of subtle point is that if you have an NFA, like if you, it, so in state diagrams, usually they don't draw the, or depends on, yeah, these we didn't draw the error state. But if you have uh, a set of NFA states where there's an error state but also valid states, then you just ignore the error state when constructed. Yeah, as long as some state is still there, you can, yeah, con construct from that. You could make an error state and then include that in the set of states as well. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, probably formally. I saw that as well before where, where students would put the, the dead state. And I just have it implied in a graph. But once you do the table, it will be complete. It will be complete. Yeah, yeah but good question. Yeah, if you're taking the script, then you may see uh, probably more comprehensive theoretical treatment of this. Uh, yeah. I'm not quite understanding what you're saying. So are the quotation marks part of the input language? So you're saying in the simple C language or in, in C or in a in simple C. Well, so the, the quotation marks, so just like everything in, in compilers or any language processing, the symbols have no a priori meaning. They're all equally just symbols. They, they have no special meaning. Uh, same thing in, in life, actually, too, depending on your philosophy. Uh, and so the meaning of the quotation mark 
just depends on the definition of the language. In simple C, we have string literals, which are preceded by, by a quotation mark and then some sequence of, I can't remember the exact definition, is sequence of probably ledgers, digits, and ending with a quote. Yeah. Right, yeah. This, yeah. So, so I guess, what, so what's the question? Are you, are you worried that you, it'll match two different regular expressions? Is that the issue? Well, so, but, but why would it? If you have a regular expression that starts with a quote, then that regular expression will be matched. Are you saying that it actually matches two different regular expressions in our language? So it matches one for int. Ah, yeah, okay. Um, so the so this is kind of how the how you handle multiple regular expressions. This is what flex does, and so flex will just match the first the first thing that matches. So if you have ambiguities in your in your lexer, it's just got to take the first one that's specified in the in the file. Um, but if you have the letter i and you have a quote, then the the quote does not match the int type name. So it could never be matched by quote int quote. You see what I mean? So if you yeah, it'll never it'll never match the int the int type. So instead, the quote will match. You can think of it as like what what ends up happening is all of the regular expressions their DFAs. You can think of them as being combined into a giant DFA that has a transition to the beginning of that of that giant DFA using the first symbol of the regular expression. And if there's ambiguities where there are multiple possible ones, then flex, I think it just matches the, the first one in order. Like in an if statement, you know, the first one will be matched. But yeah, that's a good question. Um, we didn't really cover that that much. Um, if you look at the Dragon book, which is only recommended for the course, they talk about how to uh, have multiple regular expressions to match. And flex will do it, but it's, it's more engineering, I think, than, than, than theory. I want you to get the core of how a single regular expression matches. And you could also d just make one big regular expression that matches all the tokens. You could say int or quote, and then the rest of the string. And it would be the same effect. But yeah, good question. Yeah. How to do the homework correctly? Uh, yeah, actually, yeah. Well, yeah. Sure. Who else wants to see the, the homework done like correctly? Okay. Seems like there's there's popular support for that. Let me uh, get the actual homework up. All right. So the homework is to convert. A, B, or B, A, star, C. And so the first step is to create the NFA. Let me get the uh, slides on those. All right, so the, so the way this works is we first translate it to an NFA because we have these simple patterns that we can use to process each expression in our language, concatenation, alternation, and clean closure. And so we just work in, in the order of operations 
of the regular expression language. So where should we start? Which, uh, which uh, operation is a good place to start? What's that? Concatenation? Sure, yeah. So those are easy. So concatenation, the rule is you take whatever the match for the first symbol is and connect it to the match for the second symbol. So I didn't say this explicitly. I kind of took for granted that to match a single character, just like the leaves of our tree, you create just a single transition between a starting state and an ending state. So that's how you match a single character in our language. I didn't say that explicitly, but um, that's the, the leaves of our, of our tree for this, this expression. And I made two of those, one for A and one for B, and then the concatenation pattern is to take those two kind of sub-DFAs and join their end and start states. So I'll just take this and kind of join these states together, and that's concatenation. And I can do the same thing for the other concatenation here, which I'll just write out. Okay, so I've created these two concatenation operations. What's a good next uh, operation to do? Or actually, the next operation you would have to do here. You call it alternation? All right, so let's do the alternation. So just like with concatenation, we've got this pattern for alternation where we take two sub-expressions, whatever their NFAs are, and we construct the alternation between the two with this pattern, where we create a new starting state and a new ending state, and we use epsilon transitions to the beginning of both. And this kind of like intuitively makes sense in that we're trying to match either one of them, but not both. So in the NFA style, we try to match both of them at the same time. You know, with NFAs, we can be in multiple states at the same time. So we're trying to match both of these patterns in parallel. So let me construct video again. Okay, there we go. Okay, so here's our pattern for alternation. We construct a new start state and end state for the alternation, and then go to the two sub expressions with epsilon transitions. 
and go to the final state with epsilon transitions. So effectively just matching both in parallel. Our next operation, we can do this clean star. So we've got our pattern for clean star. Or clean closure. And same idea. We take whatever our sub-expression is, and then we and we add these transitions and states. So we make a new start state, and this is basically saying we're going to try matching no nothing from this pattern. We're going to either skip matching this pattern, and in parallel, we're going to try matching the pattern. And every time we have a complete match in parallel, we're going to try matching it again, or just moving on to the next set of states. So we use this pattern to construct a new, so here's our, this is our sub-expression here, and we're going to construct our NFA for clean closure um, around this sub-expression. So here's our starting state for the clean closure. Here's our ending state for the clean closure. Here's skipping over matching that pattern in parallel. And here's trying to match the pattern again. And then finally, we just have a single concatenation left to do. And so concatenation works by taking the sub-expression on the left and the sub-expression on the right and joining their start and end states. And that's the end of our uh, expression. So the, f the final state for this is the final state for the entire regular expression. And uh, yeah, and we have an in edge for the starting state. Questions on that? Did I make any mistakes? Did I get it, did I get it right? Questions on that? OK, probably, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sega? Oh, yeah. Where? where? Uh, Here? Yes. Do we, could we, couldn't we just have what says that someone there is transition? Make this the A transition? Yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah. There are, I mean, so there, there's no guarantee that there's a single NFA for a single value expression. There's no guarantee that there's one regular expression for the same language that you input. In fact, it's a... I don't know for regular expressions, but it, it's either a hard or undecidable problem to determine whether two regular expressions are matching the same string. Regular expressions is probably solvable. Parsing, I think, is not. Um, but yeah, there's lots of ways to do it. So the reason I show it this way, and, and in compilers in general, is uh, I want to make it easy on myself. I don't want to have to think about optimizations. Instead, um, I, uh, I want the, each phase of this to be as easy as possible. So there's only three patterns here. And if you were to write a program to do this, sure, while you're writing it, you can try to add optimizations. But I'd rather do the easy thing, this kind of constructive laziness, and then come up with a scheme for doing optimization later. So yeah, you could totally rewrite this in lots of different ways. But this is a mechanical way, systematic mechanical way to do it. That's much easier to write in a, in a program, in my opinion. Yeah. You mean this was pointing here? Um, no, I mean, uh, sorry, could you like number them? Sure. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Thank you. Sure. Um, so instead of starting the um, going backwards from node nine, I did it from five to eight. Would that work as well, or is this way to work? Um, yeah, so I, I think similar to the previous question, uh, there are lots of equivalent versions. There's lots of equivalent state machines that recognize the same language. Um, I just showed this pattern way of doing it for the same reason, to make it systematic. Uh, so sure, you could use your own intellect to try to come up with optimizations, but I'm lazy. If a computer can do it, I'd rather have a computer do it and not, not have to think about it. Uh, yeah. Also, 
Yeah. yeah. Um, if nine can, oh yeah, like a cycle of epsilons. It's a good question. Uh, I mean, I guess in some sense it's like transitioning infinitely forever. Um, and if you were to implement that in a machine, depending on how you implement it, you might just have one set of states that's just constantly going all the time. You know, but if you think of it working in parallel, the rest of the machine will, will continue to make progress, right? I think. And then if, you no? Know, yeah. I was just thinking, we'd end up with an infinite number of splits. Right. With an increasing number of yeah, like, yeah. So depending on when you did those splits, when you did those splits, the machine would make progress or not. I mean, you could, <laughs> yeah, to get like thinking about infinity here. Now, when you take the epsilon closure, that's finite still. And so, I think it still won't be a problem. I mean, it's just saying one part of the machine is constantly matching empty all the time. And so, yeah, depending on how you organize your um, NFA simulator, you, know, you could just not make progress. That's true. Yeah, question, question over there. Uh, in the homework, I put my, uh, the back arrow from 10 to 1. Would that still work the same way, or would there be a different result? I think that's exactly what uh, your colleague was just saying, is that this would be like an epsilon cycle. Right? This will just be like a cycle. Yeah, I never thought about that. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it, in, in some sense, yeah, it, 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 like the machine, in a, the strict interpretation of the machine, it is like infinitely forking states. Um, but, yeah, those states are just reading no input, so, yeah. Can it start at zero? Uh, so, well, it starts at whatever the, the starting state is. So here I numbered it one, so one is the starting state. There is no zero state here in the way I numbered it. But that's just a convention. There, there's nothing intrinsic in the state machine. Uh, these, this is just metadata about the state machine. These are not intrinsic to the operation of the state machine. I could have called this A, B, 7. It doesn't, doesn't matter. So you could start at zero if you wanted to. You mean add an additional state before, before this? Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, the numbers are not intrinsic to the machine. So I could have started at 5 if I wanted and then went up by 3. I sort of could have said 5, 20, 20 million, 7, negative 4. They're, 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 they're just metadata about the machine. They're not part of the machine's operation. There was another question, I think. Yeah. You answered it. Oh, okay. okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. So that's, so that's just, um, I mean, yeah, they're, this is using this, only, you know, there's only three patterns, one for each operation. Um, and if we just apply those patterns rotely, <coughs> then we can translate any regular expression without thinking about optimization. And even if we were doing optimization, once we go to the DFA step, then think of that as a kind of optimization where we, doesn't matter if you have these extra epsilon closures in your DFA, they're going to be eliminated anyway. They're all going to become deterministic. And so yeah, premature optimization, you know, is a root of all evil, right? So you uh, get things correct before optimal. Otherwise, you know, if you have a car whose wheels don't work but it has the fastest engine in the world, you're not going to drive anywhere. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so let's do the um, translation to uh, to a DFA. All right, so our starting state is one. And so what's the first step in a NFA to DFA conversion? Yeah? I thought I heard something, yeah. Does it uh, include all the epsilon closure? Yeah, you do the epsilon closure. So you, you, st you start at a particular state, whatever state you're in, and you perform the, eps whoops, you perform the epsilon closure. And the epsilon closure just follows all of the epsilon edges. And uh, that's your subset of NFA states. And you map that to a single state in your DFA simulation of this NFA. So we've got one, two, three, six. So one, three, six. 10. Did I miss any? Okay. 
So there's our, our first DFA state. So let's call it uh, Roman numeral one. And then we take our, all the symbols in our language and we find all of the subsets of NFA states that the NFA will enter for each symbol in our language. So this is exactly what a compiler does. Compiler is accounting for every possible input to your program and translating it to another language that will process that input with the equivalent comp uh, computation, same output in our, for our deterministic um, language. Okay. So, what are all the transitions from these states via A? What states do we have? So, we're, so we only have A transitions here. So there's only one possible transition that can happen. I think, right? B to, uh, 3 to 4. So our new state, let's assume it's going to be a different state, starts with 4. And, uh, okay, so we have this set of states that Roman numeral state 1 transitions to. Uh, so what's the epsilon closure of that? Of, this, of starting with 4. Well, there's no epsilons, right? There's no epsilons, so it's just 4. Anybody get anything different for this? Okay. So we've got a new DFA state 4, a Roman numeral 2, which just contains the original state 4, the NFA state 4. And let's do the same thing for B. So for B, I think we have only one transition again, 6 to 7. So our new state consists of 7 plus the epsilon closure. There's no epsilon transitions from 7, so our NFA subset just contains the state 7, and so we can give it a new uh, DFA state number here, Roman numeral 3. Questions on this so far? Does this look like what, what you guys got? Okay, because I, I, don't, I don't remember the right answer to this, so um, I'm just working it out just like you guys did. All right, so we do the same thing. So we transition from all the states in this subset, 4, to 5 using state A, and we get Nothing, right? Oh, yes, yeah, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Ah, so it was not entirely right. I forgot that C was in her language. So, yeah, let's do C first. So in all these states, there's only one transition for C. And so we go to state 11 here. And there's no epsilon transitions from 11. And this is also the accept state because... 11 is an accepting, uh, is the accept state of the NFA. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so we're in state 4. There's only one possible transition out of state 4. It's B, and it goes to 5. So um, I predict that this is probably going to be a new state, NFA state. So NFA state starts at 5 and then has... An epsilon, the, if we take the epsilon closure, we get 5, 9, 10, 2, 6, and 3. Just follow all of the transitions here. So that will be 2, 3, 6, 5, 9, 10. 2, 3, 6, 5, 9, 10. And what about for A? Well, there are no transitions for A from state 4. So this is the empty set or the error set in our DFA. And same thing for C. There are no possible transitions. And I can kind of predict where this is going. The, the 3 has a similar pattern here where we transition into state 8. So there's going to be some new state, and the other two are going to be empty sets. So this goes to state 8. So it's 8, 9, 10, 2, 3, 6.
questions on why that is? So it's the same. It's the same pattern as this. Same pattern as as the one for A, where instead we're we're doing this single transition on A from state um, seven. Questions on this? I know I'm going through this a little faster. But. Shall I move on, or is this clear? Clear to everyone? Yeah. Oh yeah. Sorry. So state 11 has no transitions. It's already the accept state. There are no ways to transition from any symbol out of the accept state in our uh, NFA. So then we just have to contend with this next one. So I expect what's going to happen is we can either go back to um, So we're, we're here, right? We're in these states. This or this. And so we're either going to take this transition, this transition, or this transition. And we've already seen the results of taking those transitions before. So that's um, here, here, and here. So let me see if I can wing it. So going to state four is the result of taking A. So I'm guessing it's that. And this is the accept state. Uh, did I get that wrong? <laughs> Anybody see that I get it wrong? That, 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 that look right? Questions? Yeah. What's that? You got the same thing? Oh, good. Okay. Then hopefully I got it right. Questions? Questions? Yeah. Um, do you mean will there only be a single result, or are there many ways to order the? Yeah, I mean you could. So I kind of went like breadth first. You could have gone depth first. You could have followed A here, or yeah, you could have taken any order to build the table. I think, if I'm remembering the theory right that there is a single optimal DFA for every NFA, I think. There's a single DFA that has the minimum number of states, or at least there, there is a minimum number of NFA states for every NFA. And you can always achieve it with the subset construction. Um, but yeah, there, there are many ways to construct the table. The table will be, I think the table will always be the same, except you may have different state numbers or state orderings, I think. But ask in discrete, because I can't remember. All right, questions? Questions on this? Yeah. All right, so let me, uh, let's move on to parsing. And so, uh, parsing is actually very closely related to regular expressions. Regular, you can think of regular languages as kind of like the fruit fly of language processing. And this kind of segues nicely into why we have parsing. Uh, so even though we have this powerful tool that allows us to implement all sorts of different computing problems, it also allows us to match these infinite, infinite sets of strings um, it turns out that there are certain languages that we can define that you could never write a regular expression to define. You could never make a single finite state machine that would recognize that language. So the kind of intuition here is that regular expressions can't do parsing. And so there's this kind of humorous answer on Stack Overflow, I, I think probably, when was this from? Probably uh, 14 years ago. So probably I think people on Stack Overflow are getting the same questions about, I'm trying to do web scraping, and I'm trying to scrape HTML pages. You know, you want to find phone numbers, you want to get data. Web scraping is probably something you guys, probably many of you, have who's tried to do web, web scraping before? Probably several, yeah, a good number of people. This is like a common task. And so I think on Stack Overflow, people are just getting questions like, 
I'm trying to make this regular expression, because you know, programmers often know about regular expressions, they have them in all languages. And they're like, I'm trying to match and scrape this web page with a regular expression, and it's always like breaking. Like it's never working in all cases, and I can't figure out the right pattern. And so somebody wrote this extremely sarcastic uh, post devolving into like, you know, chaos about how, uh, you know, trying to do HTML scraping with regular expressions is like the end of the world and how nobody can do it. Because I think it was just such a common question. You can see there's tons of updates, updates on this. Uh, I guess there's disputes about the answer's content. Okay. Uh, but they locked, the whole, they locked the whole question. But basically, you know, there was lots and lots of people trying to use regular expressions, this, this really good tool that exists in languages to try to parse or really try to process or scrape HTML pages. But they didn't take this compiler's class or a discrete class uh, because otherwise they would have realized that you cannot do, you cannot process HTML, which is a structured language like C or simple C, with regular expressions because regular expressions cannot represent the kinds of patterns that we have in HTML. It's impossible to do it. And so why is it? Why is that the case? If we look at HTML or, or other languages that have matching in them, uh, regular expressions cannot ensure that you've got matched parentheses or curly braces or begin document, end document. There's no way to express this in regular expressions. Now, you might, be, you might be looking at this and saying, well, okay, I can make a regular expression for this, right? So who thinks they can write a regular expression to match this input string? You know, curly, open curly brace, open curly brace, open curly brace, close curly brace, close curly brace, close curly brace. Yeah. Oh, a lot of people have that. Yeah, you're the first. Yeah. Can we write a regular expression that will match this string? Okay, so I could just literally write, I could just literally write, you know, six concatenations or whatever this is to just match this particular order. And so you could write a regular expression to match. Now, what if I wanted to match uh, a single pair, a double pair, or three? How would I match these three cases with regular expressions? <coughs> What's that? You can't? Well, let's say I just have this language where I have either three nested curly braces, two nested curly braces, or one nested curly brace. Can I match that with regular expressions? Yeah, you can use alternation, right? I can just have alternation between these three options, and I can match them. I can match them. So the problem is, is when I try to go to match any number of nested parentheses. So if I change this language from not just these three cases of it, but I want to match, you know, one way to say it is, I want to match this n times with, well, my terrible handwriting makes it hard to see. So if I want to match n <coughs> curly braces, open curly braces with n closed curly braces, Writing a regular expression for this is demonstrably impossible to do. Yeah? Is this a pumping lemma problem? This is the pumping lemma problem. So the pumping lemma, I think, will disprove the uh, exist. right? It'll, it'll prove that you can't write a regular expression, right? Is that right, the pumping lemma? Yeah. I can't remember. So it'll, yeah, so the pumping lemma is basically a, a proof technique for proving that a particular language definition cannot be written in a regular expression. So if you take discrete and you, you, you know you like this, the theoretical side, you're actually going into a mathematical model of regular expressions and how to actually prove that you can't do what this uh, poor questioner on Stack Overflow attempted to do and got this extremely sarcastic answer that everyone seemed to like. Actually, we didn't even see there. So this is the question. It was, I need to match all of these opening tags but not self-closing ones. And they came up with a regular expression to try to do it. And uh, if he had taken discrete and learned the pumping lemma, he would be able to convince himself that he can't write a uh, 
something to do matching. So I don't know exactly what it's looking for, but you won't be able to do. You won't be able to match start and end uh, HTML tags. And so if you're taking discrete, then you will see this pumping lemma, this proof that your definition of language cannot be expressed with regular expressions. Okay, so the kind of good way to say this is finite state automata can't count. I don't exactly know what that means because they can count. I mean, you can count up to a finite number with state machines. But they can't handle, they can't count, uh, you know, they can't keep track of how many things you've seen and then use that later in the machine. So they can't, they can't count this number here. They can't count how many thought I had resolved this. So I can't count this number n and then save this number somehow and reuse that to check the rest of your expression. So I mean, they can count, but they can't hold on to the count and then use that count later in the matching. And so that's kind of unfortunate because we have this language you know, it's convenient to have nested languages like HTML or C, it's convenient to do that, and we have this really powerful tool of finite state machines, but they're not going to be able to do your, your language processing problem. So let's take a, let's, let's look intuitively why this is. So why is it that a finite state machine can't match this language? So let's start with, uh, let's start with matching, try to match this pattern here. So to match open brace and, and end brace, Let's draw a finite state machine to try to match this. So we've got our starting state. We transition on an open brace. And then, uh, oh, this is going to get, I better have good penmanship here for this. And then we just match an end curly brace. And so let me just do a little epsilon transition here. So this matches, right? This matches paired curly braces. So what if we want to match, allow us to match a single curly brace or two nested curly braces? Well, we could add another level of curly brace matching. We have this other level of curly brace matching. And let me make this clear that this epsilon is not a starting brace here. And maybe you start to see the problem here, that if we want to add another level, well, we have to add two more states to do that. And we have to keep adding states for every level of matched curly braces that we want in our state machine. And if we want to define a language where n can be any number, well, what's going to happen to our finite state machine? How many states is it going to end up having? Infinite number. It's not going to be a finite state machine anymore. It's, so it's not a finite state machine. If it has an infinite number of states, regular expressions don't map to all possible states that have infinite number of states. So that's the, the crux of why finite state machines can't count, or they can't do this arbitrary uh, matching of language constructs. You need this unbounded number of states for your language. So basically, I mean, you could take one instance of the input language and then make a finite state machine to match that one, but there's no way to express arbitrary nesting nests or arbitrary H nested HTML statements are arbitrary. You could set a maximum limit on them and you'd have a finite state, but there's no way to express unbounded arbitrary number of, of matched constructs. Questions on this? If you haven't baked discrete yet, or big discrete, I don't remember which one. Is it discrete or big discrete? Big discrete. 
big screen. If you think, yeah, most people take it after this class. Um, you'll see, you'll go into this in more detail, but here I hope at least you have the intuition about why this is the case and also see why this is important, at least to, to some degree, in computing, why it's important to be able to think about these mental models because there's a lot of computing tasks where we are, we're doing state machines and state transitions. All right, questions on this? All right. Um, and so this, this, the kind of language that has this nested structure, um, there's a lot of cases of this. So not just HTML and C. Human languages have this kind of structure. So think about these two sentences in English. You've got, the person walks home. Subject, verb, noun. Just like, you know, just like you kind of learn in grammar school. Um, but if you look at this next sentence, the person I went to school with walks home. So we have the same words as the prior sentence. But we've got some extra words in here. And so, What's the meaning of these words? It's basically almost another sentence. I went to school with, or a clause. So what is that uh, referring to in this sentence? The person. They said it instantly. You know, you knew immediately that this refers to the person. And uh, what is the person doing? Walking home, right? So nobody had any doubt about what this sentence means, even though if you, if you didn't understand English or listen to another language, you may be puzzled as to why these words and these words are connected in the same way as this previous sentence, even though they're interrupted with a seemingly arbitrary set of symbols that if you didn't already you know, understand human language, you'd be like, well, how would you know that these words are associated, walks home is associated with this person, even though they're interrupting the sentence with these extra words. And not only did you know that the person matched with walks home, you knew intuitively that I went to school was referring to the person, not to the home. It wasn't modifying walks, right? Like nobody would think the person I went to school with walks home meant the home I went to school with. Right? You would never think that. And the, the reason for this, or at least the theoretical reason for this, is that we have a built-in notion of grammar, that we are somehow understanding that these two things match, even though they're interrupted with some symbols in between. And so it's a little, you know, if you squint really hard, you'll realize that this is the same problem as matching, say, curly braces, or matching HTML tags in an HTML file, is that we have some way to kind of keep track of the person in our minds while we go off on this other part of the sentence, and as soon as this other part of the sentence, I went to school with, this clause is done, we can retrieve that state that, about the person and match walks home with the person. You see what I mean? So just like when you say if and end if, you in your mind know that end if is matched with if. But if you're just some simple computer that's just reading sequences of tokens, what would make you think or what would allow you to understand that the person matches with walks home. And it's the same problem as, say, scraping HTML. And so this syntax, this notion of syntax or grammar, is what not only defines that this is valid to do, that this is, is understandable or legal in the grammar to do, but it also keeps track of the fact that the person walks home are matched together. It shows what the value ranges of, of words are, but it also, it also keeps track of the fact that we still have subject, verb, object in this sentence, even though there are these nested deviations into other symbols or other constructs in the language. And so for humans, you may just be like completely unaware of this, do this automatically. So um, one of the earliest thinkers about this kind of computational notion of language was Noam Chomsky, who had the argument that grammar was not just some academic exercise to describe a language, but it was actually an inbuilt machine in your brain that you were born with 
Uh, and some of the evidence was that other animals don't have language, at least this kind of nested, arbitrarily nested languages that other that humans have. You know, I'm not an expert in this. I'm not an anthropologist or linguist. But from my understanding, there are no examples of lang of animals that do arbitrarily nested sentence constructs. There are animals that will do sentences like "go home" or "give me." Um, but this, as far as I understand, correct me if I'm wrong. This is not my field of expertise. Is that this seems to be unique to humans? This notion of nested constructs. And so Chomsky's argument was that this must be some built-in capability. Uh, so for instance, children, when children are learning languages, they make, to us, what sound like mistakes, like I herded my knee instead of I hurt my knee. You know, it's like, oh, you silly child, you don't know that hurt is the past tense of hurt? Well, in some sense, they're, they're correct grammatically. They're applying a pattern where all past tense has ed at the end. And so in some sense, they're more systematic than the irregular language that we just learned over time. Uh, so anyway, and then there's other arguments like the poverty of stimulus that children have very little input. Uh, they, they don't hear a huge amount of sentences, the kind of amount of correlative, the kind of amount of knowledge that a correlative technique like machine learning would need. But anyway, this is all disputable and arguable, not my area. I'm not trying to convince you anything, but uh, what came out of this was uh, a, uh, a theory about grammar and how um, it could be computed like a machine, computed in a machine. And this theory was taken into programming languages in order to process, uh, process input, input languages. And so this is the you know, same thing that I just explained, that you have this nested constructs, nested structure in your language, and some way to maintain the state of the person while you listen to this stream of tokens and then recover that state. Uh, and the way we're going to use this in the computer is we're going to computationally think of this as holding on to some state. We're going to process the sentence, and if it gets interrupted, we're going to hold on to that state, something that a finite state machine can't do arbitrarily. So we can transition to a state, but we have no way to do this for arbitrary, arbitrary nesting depths. And so we're going to show a, a new uh, abstract machine, a new computational model, where it's going to be just like regular expressions, where we're matching these patterns of symbols like sub, uh, subject, object, subject, verb, object. But we're also going to have this extra state that will allow us to hold on to some prior part of the sentence while we go off and do some other pattern matching. So just like when you write a function, when you write a function and you call another function, the machine is holding on to all those local variables for you while you go off and do this other computation. And as soon as you return to the caller, well, all your state's still there. Everything is still there and saved for you. And so always have this same kind of feeling to the recursion, language processing, pattern matching. They all have this same kind of state-saving notion to them. And in fact, if we have multiple levels of nesting depth, well, we can store all of these on a stack, which is exactly how, how functions are implemented. So let me actually, uh, let's see. Yeah, OK. Um, all right, so what a, uh, what a grammar does, the grammar that you're working on in simple C, is it's a way to write a regular expression, but for arbitrarily nested constructs. So each production is kind of like a regular expression, where you've got a sequence of symbols and possible al al alternatives of those symbols. Uh, and each new non-terminal, each new production, is like some nested construct that can interrupt the processing or pattern matching of another construct. And so the, the kind of key insight here is that, and this is kind of from the, the, the Chomsky notion of grammars, what he called generative grammars, is that grammar constructs like sentence or noun or noun phrase, these are not just academic concepts. These are actual physically embodied symbols in your mind, just like the word, you know, just like the word dog or house is something that you have some representation in your mind for, that the grammar structures themselves also have symbols that represent them. The difference is that these symbols are not uttered. They're not, I don't tell you noun, dog, verb, goes, noun, store. I don't tell you that. 
But the theory is that in your, in your mind, there is a physical representation of that symbol. This is the exact same thing, this is the exact concept we use to make a machine that will actually record those symbols that represent grammar constructs. And so that's what your, your bison grammar that you're, you know, toiling over, that's what those non-terminals are. They are physical symbols that represent the uh, grammar structures of your language. And it's not just a specification, but it is physically embodied in that machine. Now, I don't know about the, the, the theory for the human mind. Seems reasonable, but I don't, I don't know. But what I do know is that we can use this theory, this notion of having physically manifested symbols to represent grammar constructs, to make a machine that will process language in this structured way. Okay, questions question so far? Or uh, arguments or contentions? Because in linguistics and, you know, whenever you're talking about the human mind, there's always, it's always very contentious, because you're know, talking, about, talking about us. But all right, so let me give an example in uh, human language of a grammar. So in this grammar, we have, uh, we have, in quotes here, I put the words in our language, like the, person, walks to, store. So these are the, the sounds, uh, these are the, the, the symbols that we utter, the, the symbols that we use sounds or text to write. But if you take this conceit of construct symbols being physically realized, um, we can conceive of other symbols in our mind or in the machine that represent the parts of speech that we're using to express the person walks to the store. And so all of these symbols, sentence, subject, verb, the, person, these are all symbols effectively in our language. Um, and it's only these ones in quotes that actually get uttered. But when we go to process this language, when we go to generate a sentence, we're actually physically processing these symbols. Uh, and so the, the concept, of, the notion of Chomsky's generative grammar was not that we're parsing, well, you we were also parsing, but then when you go to speak, we're like physically walking this grammar. We're starting with the, some physical representation of sentence and expanding it out in order to express what we want to express. And so think about when you talk extemporaneously, you might say, you might interrupt yourself, you might say, yeah, I was walking to the store, which, oh, by the way, was, uh, you know, new th this year. And, uh, and I was walking to the store that was new this year, and I walked by this dog, and it was a really cute dog. And so you'll kind of interrupt yourself, hold on to the state, and go back to your sentence as you talk. And the, the theory is that you have some built-in grammar in your, in your brain that's allowing you to track, track these things. And so these special symbols, they don't represent things we speak, but they're tracking the constructs in the language. And so in our first project, what we're doing is we're making this notion of grammar, symbols for the actual grammar constructs, explicit in the machine. The machine is actually representing those constructs and using those to uh, infer the grammatical construct of the input. So the kind of Chomsky notion of, um, of generative grammar was an explanation of how language is produced. In our machine, we're, we already have an expression in our language. We have a program. And so what we're, what we're using this for is we're trying to infer the grammatical structure of the input language just with an example of the input language. So assuming that we have the grammar, the parsing problem is to figure out how that input language was generated from the grammar. So it's like kind of reverse engineering the grammatical structure of the input. Yeah. So I just gave you the lecture. Yeah, this, I, I, I wanted to make the projects kind of confined and make sure you had enough preparation for it. That was why, yeah. Plus the, the, the lecture is pretty simple in our, in our language and Flex is probably even more annoying to deal with than, than Bison, so. Um, but if you'd like, you know, a, a project, I can, I, can, I can give you work on, uh, you know, doing lexing. Or you can build a lexer too, you know, now that you have the uh, regex to DFA translation, you can actually build your own build your own uh, lecture. <coughs> okay, questions on this so far? Thoughts? Arguments?
Okay, and um, <coughs> so alternatives are also expressible in this in these grammars. So notice here we have multiple ways to match a noun in this language, and so alter alternatives are expressed by just making multiple productions for the same symbol. Uh, and you can actually show that <coughs> any regular expression can also be matched with a grammar. Because we have alternation, um, we have concatenation, and then I, I, should, I, I hinted at this in your project, we have clean closure with self-reference in our grammar. If we have a self-referencing, I don't have an example here, but in the, in the parser we have lists being constructed by having self-referencing grammar constructs. Like declaration list is declaration followed by declaration list. Okay. Just see where we at for for um, timing. All right. So there, there's a there's a formal way uh, that we can use to model grammars. And just like with regular expressions where you've got you know, a set of symbols and you have these set of operations on symbols, context-free grammars, you can formalize these, and you'll, you'll learn about this more in Big Discrete. Uh, but there are only four things you need to define a language using a context-free grammar. So the first are the terminal symbols, or the terminals. And you can think of these as the, the actual words in the language. These are the things that the lecture produces for us. The spoken parts of the language, the parts that are actually in the text file in the program. Those are terminals. The non-terminals, those are the unspoken parts. Those are the names of the grammar constructs, like sentence or declaration list. Productions are the names of the rules of the grammar. And so productions, just like we saw in the Bison grammar, these map one non-terminal symbol in a context-free grammar to some sequence of other symbols, be it terminals or non-terminals. So we had like, uh, main is the main keyword, followed by an open curly brace, followed by a non-terminal, a, uh, a declaration list. And then just like in, in state machines, we have the starting symbol. This might be sentence or program in simple C. And so I use this, this notion of a context-free grammar to write this grammar, where... Uh, so what are, what are the terminals in this language? Or this grammar? What are the terminal symbols? Yeah, yeah. The person. Yeah, all the quoted ones. These are the terminals in our language. What are some non-terminals in this language? Yeah, noun, phrase, verb, object, all the stuff on the left-hand side. And what, what's a rule in this language? Or what's a production in this language? Yeah, so, so, yeah, sentence maps to subject verb object. And where's the starting symbol in this language? So it's not really, it's not really said here explicitly, but by convention, when you see a context-free grammar, the first production, the non-terminal of the first production is the starting symbol. This is just a convention. Um, but if you wanted to find this formal, you'd, you know, you'd put a symbol name for the, for the starting symbol. So in our Bison grammar, we had, you know, there was, a, there was a little keyword in the Bison grammar that said start program. And so, you, you know, Bison wants you to explicitly define it. In like this big discrete or in, in the kind of the math world, by convention, it's the first production's non-terminal. It's the starting symbol. So those are the four pieces. That's all we need to define a formal grammar, a formal context-free grammar. And so with this, we can express a larger set of possible language patterns than we could with regular expressions. We can express matching with this. Okay, so let me give an example of how these um, grammars can be used to either match or generate language, uh, examples of our language. So here's the, the sequence you do to generate a string from the grammar. So you start with the, the starting symbol, the starting non-terminal. Pick some production for that non-terminal to use to generate the next part of your language. And then substitute that symbol with the right-hand side, with the rule. And then just repeatedly do this with each symbol in your language until you reach terminals in the language. So this is why they're called terminals. So non-terminals, 
can uh, have more expansions that are possible, terminals stop the expansion. Okay, so let me show an example of this with our uh, with our grammar here. So let's pick a sentence. How about the store walks to the person? So how might we generate this using this systematic application of our grammar? Well, we always start with a starting symbol. And there's only one possible rule of production that we can apply here. And that's subject, verb, object. These are non-terminals, so we can continue to expand them. And so let's take them one at a time. Which subject, so there's only, there's only one subject here, noun phrase. Let's expand verb. We only have one verb here. Walks to. And object only has one expansion noun phrase. So there's one step of our expansion. We've still got non-terminals to expand. So noun phrase. Again, there's only one possible noun phrase expansion, which is the followed by a noun. We've already expanded walks to. And here we've got another noun phrase, which according to our rules is, so a noun phrase expands to the followed by a noun. We've already expanded walks to to a terminal. And noun phrase also expands to the followed by a noun. And now there's only two more non-terminals left. There's only two options for noun here, person or store. So if we wanted to match the store walks to the person, we would use the store expansion for our noun. Walks to is already a terminal. And then person is the only other option we have for noun. Questions on this process? We just apply one of the grammar rules at each step of this derivation, or in you know, some cases several grammar rules, at each step of this derivation in order to go from a single symbol that represents any possible utterance in this language to one particular instance of the symbol in this language. Questions on this? Now, if we recorded now, we, if we recorded this, the set of generations in a uh, in a some sort of data structure, like let's say we took each one of these arrows and made a pointer out of this that pointed to all of the other symbols that got expanded by the rule. Let's see what would happen. So let's take sentence, and let's just keep a pointer to each of the grammar constructs that got expanded from sentence. We do the same thing. So subject expands to noun phrase. Verb expands to walks to, 
object expands to noun phrase. And if we keep doing this for uh, the derivation of the string from a language, This represents the same information in this derivation, but what data structure is this? This probably looks familiar. A tree, right? A tree. So you can hopefully start to see this deep connection here between trees, recursion, and language, where there's this computational analog between some computation and language processing. Yeah. The terminal is the leaves, yeah. The terminal is the leaves of the language, yeah. yeah so in, the, in, the, in our compiler, we use a lexer to produce the terminals. And so you could actually, you, you, you could avoid having a, a lexer altogether and use the context-free grammar to define it because you can define regular expressions in it. But it's kind of a convention in, in compilers. Also, the, the lexer can be more performant than the parser. But yeah, once you have a terminal, you're done. So terminals are leaves of the tree, non-terminals are inner nodes. Uh, deriving a sentence from this is the same thing as finding a tree where all of the leaves are the symbols in your actual input language, your actual utterance in the language. Yeah, you had a question? Yeah, terminals are leaf nodes. Yeah, exactly right. So terminals are leaf nodes. And and Yes, exactly right. So, yeah, exactly good insight. So if you do a traversal of this tree, you probably learned about tree traversals, and maybe we're wondering, like, who cares? If you take a post-order traversal of this tree, actually, it probably doesn't matter which traversal you do, but if you do a post-order traversal of this tree and just print the leaf nodes, you will recover the, the sentence that we derive from this language. So one way to think about language is that when you're generating a sentence or you're listening to a sentence, mechanically you're actually keeping track involuntarily of all of this sentence structure which allows you to, say, interrupt part of your sentence in order to go off on some tangent and then the listener will still understand where the subject and, and verb are, even if you're interrupting this with clauses. And we use that same notion in the machine, where the machine is actually tracking physically tracking this entire tree structure, even though you've only told it this string, you've only told the terminals in the language, and the computer, or your, your mind, will infer this structure automatically from that input sentence. And that's, that's pretty astonishing, right? Like you, if you, if you didn't know like, we're able to speak and understand language, and you have another program to do it, you'd wonder how these seemingly arbitrary sequences of strings could possibly be interpreted grammatically or how you could figure out what the grammatical structure is. And uh, the kind of key takeaway here is that if you know, and this is a big if, if you know your grammatical structure, you can match any valid string generated from that grammar, you can always match and recover how it was generated. You can match its parse tree by looking at the input, if you have the grammar. All right, questions on this? Is that cool? Is that kind of, kind of, kind of fun? So, I don't know. I like compilers. This is maybe more fun for me than you. Um, but, uh, yeah, I find this fact pretty interesting, that there's this, there's this relationship between language and language processing, and... So I had this, this slide, uh, I don't know where the slide is, but there's this, there's this parallel between machine models, models of computation, like with finite state machines, push down automata in the case of parsing, and regular expressions, regular languages, grammatical languages. There's this like, correspondence between the two, which is kind of an astonishing thing. If you think about it, like why would language be computational 
Um, but if you think about processing a language, trying to understand what it means, or translating a language, or a human processing language, well, there would have to be some sort of computation. At least in a machine, there would have to be one. Um, and if you think materialistically about the physical body, there has to be something embodied that's actually doing this simple processing. All right, so uh, questions? Oh yeah, that oh, actually is right here. So this was the yeah. So anyway, this is the uh, correspondence between, or this is the the, net, the 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 fact that finite state machines can all be represented with pushdown automata, and I had this other diagram of the correspondence between regular languages and finite state machines, pushdown automata and um, parsers. But anyway, so that's the kind of like theory takeaway here. Um, and we're just going to exploit this in order to be able to process input languages, programming languages. So all right, let's, let's leave it there for a break. Um, let's come back at 11.10. Uh, and um, yeah, we'll see you soon. All right. Let's go to the second half of our lecture today. So we just did a lot of kind of conceptual exploration of this notion of grammars and syntax, um, correspondence between the computing model, like state machine models, and languages. Um, so for our compiler, our goal is to use this conceptual notion of the definition of a language in order to figure out what this tree is. Because just like in the toy compiler, once we had that parse tree, uh, we could write this tree walking algorithm that would just walk through each construct and spit out assembly code in order to translate it. If we just had raw terminals in the, from our language, it would be not so easy to figure out which assembly code pattern to use in order to generate it. The parse tree was what enabled us to be able to do this translation. So in the second half, I'd like to go over briefly parsing algorithms. I'm not going to go into too much detail into them. I, I'm going to show you a couple. And we'll do a little exercise, just like we do with regular uh, languages, to basically run one of these parsers. They're, you know, just like with the, the regular expression stuff, it's a little kind of fiddly and technical, um, but I'm going to try to give you some examples so you can um, go through it. And once you take big to speed, I think they're also going to go over uh, what are called pushdown automata. It's another um, model of computation that's strictly more powerful than finite state machines. Okay. So regardless of whatever your philosophy is around linguistics and computation, how the, how the human body actually works, one thing is for sure is we can use this notion in the, in the machine in order to process, translate, interpret programming languages. We can design programming languages grammatically, and you know, arguably they're much easier to use than just writing assembly code. And we can use this structured language and the theory around grammars in order to write a program that will process this input language. And so the whole task of taking some string in our language and deriving what the tree must have been to generate it is called parsing. Parsing is the problem of taking an input language and inferring what the, tr what the uh, grammatical structures used to generate it were. And this tree structure, the fact that we can represent the derivation of that input, language, input example from the grammar, this is called a parse tree. And it is the main data structure that every compiler front end uh, uses for all of the processing it does before generating back end code. It's one of the key data structures in a compiler. And so our task is to take the grammar and take this, take any utterance in the language and infer this parse tree. And there's been decades of research on this, decades of work on this, and there's a whole range of parsing algorithms. If you have the Dragon Book, it'll give you lots of them. I'm going to 
just conceptually go over two, and then we're actually going to run one of these algorithms, and you'll do that for your, for your homework as well. So the first one is what we did in the first toy compiler. It's called recursive descent. Uh, it's called a top-down approach because we start with the starting symbol, and if you remember, there was one parsing function for each grammar construct in our language. We had one for statement, one for uh, one for um, statement list, one for statement, one for expression. And the way it works is each function recursively calls or just calls another grammar construct. Actually, let me show the uh, toy compiler. It's probably easier to see in the toy compiler. want to make this uh, a better theme. Okay, this was our toy compiler, and I had hinted at this notion of a grammar by having this little schematic as to what this parsing function does. And so it parses a statement list by just recursively calling the other non-terminals, the non-terminals on the right-hand side of the rule. So it's matching this production by just recursively calling the functions that parse the sub-expressions. And so same thing with statement. The statement function would call the expression function and then match the semicolon. And so this is a recursive descent or top-down parser. We have one function for each grammar construct. We call the grammar construct that's, that is the starting symbol. And then if we've designed our functions correctly, it should just, the function call, call, call trace should basically just be the parse tree. The order that these are called will be the order uh, that the parse tree follows. So if each one of these grammar constructs has a parsing function, then this tree represents the order in which those functions are called. This is why actually we learned about trees in recursion, probably in CS1 or CS2, you learn about how you can model recursion using a tree. And because grammar constructs have this recursive computational nature, we can use a series of recursive functions in order to outline and discover what this parse tree is. Now, recursive descent parsers have one big weakness to them. Can anyone take a guess as to what kind, you know, what what might be a challenge to writing grammars that are recursive descent? Yeah. I don't know about writing, but you're pulsating pretty much. Sure, yeah. Well, there's, yeah, there's a performance limitation to this that if you have a very, you know, every list is a recursive descent into that list. So in our toy compiler, if we had a hundred element list, our stack, our function call stack would have to be a hundred elements long. So yeah, that's definitely definitely a weakness. Yeah. So ba yeah, ba well, so the terminals are effectively the, ba the kind of like the base case. Um, so here, uh, there's no base case for this function. So this is like the terminal here. This is kind of like a so. What distinguishes this from kind of classic recursive algorithms? is that we don't just have one recursive algorithm that calls itself. We have a whole series of them. So some of them cause recursion, like statement list. Statement list has recursion in it because it's self-referential. That recursion might be indirect. <coughs> like in our, pi our bison parser, that recursion may happen not in the immediate body of the function, but in some later call, some, some uh, descendant call. And so sure, base cases are kind of a challenge here. How do you make sure that your recursion is going to terminate? And so there's, uh, let's see if I have this in. Well, so depending on how you design your grammar, you may end up with a very serious problem when trying to do recursion.
So let's say I had another kind of list where I process my recursion happens as the first element in my rule, where my list is constructed of some other list followed by the list element. So you can imagine doing this for, you know, depending on your order of operations, you might want to have the tree go to the left instead of the right. But if I've got a recursive descent parser, and the first thing I do is just recursively call myself, <coughs> well, the parser's never going to terminate, kind of like the example of having an epsilon transition. Depending on the order in which you try to expand this grammar construct, if you're just implementing this with recursive descent, with recursive functions, well, you're just going to get this infinite recursion. Even though there may be a finite parse tree for this, there may be a way to derive, you know, there's, there's, if you can derive a, uh, if you can derive a string in your grammar with this grammar production, there's no reason you couldn't also derive it with this grammar production. There's nothing, you know, it's the equivalent languages in terms of the number of um, <coughs> strings that they can interpret, that they can recognize. Yeah. What if my list could not accept the base case of list elements? Say again? What if my list did not have a base case of the list elements? Oh, yeah, then your grammar, yeah, your grammar only matches infinite things, so. <coughs> it wouldn't be a valid grammar. So you would, you would need, yeah, you would need some alternative production that just matches, I'm yeah. I'm saying that if it was, say, list element to some other oh. pattern, what would they then so you're saying you had like my list, my list two? I think I'm saying my list, my uh, list element two, then my list, my list, list element. Like this? And then with that equivalent, would the my list list element still look at the equivalent to list element and my list? Well, it depends on what list element two is. Uh, something that's different from list element. It would just be a different language. It would be a different language. It would be a different language. My only point here is that if you have this left recursion in your grammar where you're expressing the self-reference on the left and you want to turn this into recursive functions like we did in the toy compiler, you won't be able to implement that, that uh, a parser for that grammar because you'll end up with this infinite recursion. Um, let me point this out with... I think I have the toy compiler example. <coughs> Excuse me. So in our toy compiler, we, our recursion was right recursion because <coughs> excuse me, the statement list the statement list was defined to be statement followed by statement list. But we could have also defined statement list. with left recursion. And the parse tree just would have had the statement list on the left. <coughs> so if this was, if you remember the toy compiler. This, this set of string would be matched either way, whether you had left recursion or right recursion. <coughs> the same language would be recognized by both of those grammars. And so even though these two grammar constructs would recognize strings in the same language, so, I mean, it, it, it's hard, in, or I think impossible in general, to prove the equivalence of two grammars, but for these particular, these two grammars, these two versions of Toy Compiler, we can prove that they recognize the same input language. And we can either choose to have right recursion or left recursion in our grammar construct. The problem here is not so much about specifying the grammar, but how do you parse it? How do you figure out 
whether a string is part of that language. And so if we use this uh, write recursion, well, we can do recursive functions. We can recursively call my list. Uh, as long as we have a base case, we can recursively call my list. But if my list is the first thing we call, this kind of recursive event parser, it's not going to work. It won't, we won't be able to use it to parse this grammar. So anyway, the key takeaway here is that there are you can express your, your language in any grammar you want, but parsing algorithms, they're going to be specific to the kinds of grammars that you can that you can recognize with them. That's going to be the kind of the punchline here. Is that depending on what parsing algorithm you use, there's a different set of grammars that actually you can actually work to recognize those. And you'll learn more about this in, in Big Discrete. The, uh, the, the, the computational model here is a pushdown automata. And there are ways to do general parsing, but they, they're, uh, they're, they're pretty expensive. And so in the compiler world, uh, people have looked for linear time or fast or, or near linear time parsing algorithms. And when you try to do that, you end up with um, parsers that can't recognize all possible grammars, even if some other parser might be able to. Anyway, the, the recursive of the set parser, that's what we saw in the, in the toy compiler. Where we had one function for each grammar construct. And you can think of grammars and constructs as analogous to recursion, to where each grammar construct is a function and the productions are the definition of the function and the, uh, yeah, the nested structure of the function calls. The other kind of that's all right, questions on this. I know I went over that like pretty pretty high level. Uh, the other brand of or the other class of parsers are called table driven, and these are basically just a finite state machine, just like with regular expressions, except you have a stack, and that stack will keep track, will help you count. Regular expressions couldn't keep track of saving the fact that we wanted n left, n, n, n left braces and we wanted to have n right braces. Well, if you have this stack structure, we can use that to hold on to the state of parent constructs while we go apply other regular expression pattern matching to a child construct. And in big discrete, though, this is called a pushdown automata. So we have finite state machines, which are finite state automata. And if you add a stack to that, well, now you can recognize more of the regular expressions. You can match HTML. You can do web scraping. You can process C language grammar, simple C. And so conceptually, this new machine is now not just a state machine and a little state transition algorithm, but it's a state machine plus a stack. And you can think of each of these grammar rules as being its own little state machine so you make a new finite state machine that matches each one of these grammar pro uh, constructs. And whenever there's a non-terminal, you save the state of that state machine in the stack and then go off to the child construct state machine and start processing and matching that state machine. If you see another grammar construct, push again the state of that finite state machine, go to the child construct, and so on. And then when you're done with the child construct, you just pop the state off the stack and you can continue matching that parent construct. So this is what Bison uses internally. Um, these have been like well developed for, I mean at this point, probably like 50, 60, 70 years. And they're extremely fast, they're linear time. Just like, you know, it's just they're, they're table driven. Uh, the algorithm is, is linear time with respect to the inputs. And you can, yeah, so Bison is extremely fast. Although these days a lot of Compilers have moved to recursive descent style um, parsers because there are restrictions on the kind of grammars you can write with uh, these these table driven algorithms. So anyway, the kind of like conceptual story here is there's a bunch of algorithms. They have all these funny names, um, and they all have trade offs in how efficient they are and the kinds of grammars you can support with them. Um, yeah. If you're really interested in this, you know, let me know. I can point you in the right direction. I did some, some research on parsing, so I have more knowledge than 
I, I didn't even expect or wanted to have on like parsing algorithms and all the different varieties. Uh, kind of interesting from an intellectual level, but a little, a little, a little too mathy and conceptual to be um, practical these days. This stuff is largely, largely solved. Yeah. Oh, you can write them yourself. Yeah, you can write them yourself. Um, the, the algorithm itself is super simple. If you remember the last time I, I talked about the uh, how you would write a, um, a state machine, a finite state machine processor, if you already had your, your table, then you would just be, you know, All you would need to do is just look up, you know, you, you get the character from the input, look up the next state in the uh, in your table, and that's pretty much it. I mean, then you know you check error states and all that. But um, the algorithm for running the parser is pretty straightforward. The hard part is actually getting that table. And so a lot of the work, most of the work of what those parser generators is doing is generating a table. Um, I have slides, to, to, for other people's slides, to show how that table is generated. It's a little complicated. I'll see if I can get to it today. If you're interested, I'm happy to point you in the right direction to uh, generating these tables. It's kind of a cool algorithm. It's very much like that NF, kind of like that NFA algorithm where you're just trying to find all possible cases to determine the states and you try to figure out all possible ways that this uh, input language could, could go through the, uh, through the grammar. I'll see if I have time to get to it today, but I, I will show you how to use the algorithm once you have the table. Okay, so the, so the algorithm I'm going to show you today is called the LR parsing algorithm. It's a classic one. It, uh, it's super efficient. Uh, it supports a very wide range of grammars. It supports both left and right recursion, unlike recursive descent. But there are some subtleties to writing these grammars, which if you ever had to like write a Bison grammar, you probably ran into these conflicts where it can't determine which grammar production that should be applied. And let me just go over really quickly um, the notion that these are based on. So. This is, a, this is called a shift-reduced parser. And so the way it works is our stack is empty. Our stack starts with our starting state, and we have our entire input. And the idea is we're going to read the input one at a time, like a state machine, transitioning between states. And whenever we see a nested structure, we're going to hold on to that nested structure onto the stack and work our way from the bottom of the tree and try to figure out what each parent node is up to the root. So if this is our tree here, our parsing algorithm is going to read in each token one at a time and try to figure out what the immediate parents are of the terminals and build this tree from the bottom up until we get to a root node. So it's effectively like a post order, it's like a post order tree traversal without having the tree. It's going to infer the tree from the grammar in a post order fashion. And so conceptually the goal is to go from an empty stack and all the tokens in your input to the single starting token or the single starting symbol on your stack and all input consumed. And the way it's going to work is we're going to devise a series of state transitions that will tell us to either read in another token or tell us when, whether we've matched an entire production. So shift, the shift says, the shift action means we read in the next token, basically saying we're in the middle of a production right now, you need to consume more tokens. And reduce happens whenever you reach the end of a production. It'll say, oh, I've matched uh, uh, an entire grammar construct, so create that, that parent node. So I think, yeah, so a lot of this is kind of, kind of theoretical, so I'll just, I'll just go over the kind of high level points here. So the L here means you're, you're reading from left to right from the input. R means it's the rightmost derivation, so 
Um, don't worry about that too much. It just means if you're doing the derivation, you're figuring out the rightmost part of it first instead of instead of the left. And k is the amount of look-ahead symbols you have. So it turns out that depending on the algorithm, if you're looking ahead more in the input, you can uh, just, you can parse different types of grammars. There was a kind of famous result that you only need a single look ahead for LR parsing, and it's it's equivalently powerful to having you know ten look ahead symbols. And so there's a little blurb here on how powerful these parsers are, which languages they can recognize. Uh, but I want to get into the actual operation of this of this algorithm. So just like with a finite state machine, you have state transition tables here. Um, but, like a pushdown automata, we also have a stack to record state. <coughs> and so, what Bice and other parser generators will do is it will take the grammar and it will figure out the state transitions for you. And then all the algorithm does is it reads the input one at a time and determines whether we need to either consume the input and push the input onto the stack, or by effectively looking at the tokens on the stack, whether we've seen a complete production. So if we've seen a complete production, we can pop those off the stack and push the parent node, which is you know, the reverse of a tree traversal. Did you ever have to do a tree traversal using a stack instead of recursion? Who's had to do tree traversal with a stack? Okay, not many people. So if you had to do tree traversal with a stack, you know, it's like running a, a like, um, yeah, if you go ahead, yeah, probably they do this maybe CS2 or later, but uh, you can always do any recursive algorithm with a stack because recursion is just using a stack. So with, with a recursive traversal, you would you know, push the elements onto the stack that you're waiting to process. Um, and so you can think of this analogously where it's affecting this traversal without using recursion, but instead using a stack. Okay, so. These are the actions that this LR parser will take. So there's a table that will tell you whether you need to shift, reduce, whether you finished accepting, or whether you're in an error state, just like with finite state machines. Um, except the difference here is, with a finite state machine, you know, you're only recognizing like one production, one sequence of, of symbols. But here, we need to account for the fact that we might be in nested structures. So the shift action will take one element from the input, push it onto the stack. Reduce will tell you that you've seen a complete production, and it'll say, here's the production that I've, that I've seen. So pop that production off the stack and push the parent symbol onto the stack instead. All right, so this is going into how it actually gets generated, which I'm not gonna go into. Instead, let's look at an example of operating this algorithm. So we don't have the parsing table here. I'll actually show an example of using the parsing table. But we can do this kind of intuitively by looking at the grammar. So whenever we know we're inside of a grammar production, if we see a terminal in our language, well, we can read that in and push on the stack to save it. If we see a non-terminal, then conceptually we need to go to that non-terminal and start reading and matching its input. Whenever we reach the end of a production, we know that we, uh, we can pop these elements that we've read off the stack and replace it with its parent. All right, so let me walk through what this looks like. So here's our input string. We're processing A, B, B, C, D, E. And so when we see a terminal in the input, we know that's going to be a leaf node, so we can construct a leaf node. So we're going to... Um, Process this input. We're going to process this input one element at a time and gradually build up this tree as we recognize entire productions. So that's this is going to be the tree here. This is going to be the input string that we've read in. This is going to be the string left to read. This is our stack. So we'll be pulling in tokens one at a time and figuring out bottom up which parent nodes to construct in order to derive this parse tree. So questions on the setup here? So here will be, this is our complete parse tree for this input string. 
Uh, let me just briefly walk through the grammar here so you can see. So S, the rule for S is A followed by capital A, capital B, E. And so we have capital A and E here. Uh, sorry, we have A and E here, and here's capital A, capital B. And then the trick is there are two possible ways to parse A. And so in this example, both versions are here, and our parser is going to need to figure out which one is being parsed. Okay, let me step through this algorithm and show you how the parse tree is constructed and show you what happens with the state. So we see in A, our algorithm, the uh, parse table is going to tell us that we need to shift A. So it's going to put A onto the stack and move to the next input. It's going to shift A onto the stack, constructs a leaf node, and move to the next input in our string. When we see B, now the parse table is not going to be able to, um, the parse table is going to figure out actually that we're inside of this grammar production. How it does it, there are slides, I'll show you how that works. It basically looks at all possible possibilities. And they'll be able to figure out that we're actually inside of this production here. Or we must be, or we have an invalid input. And so the, the algorithm effectively knows that we're here at the end of this, because there's, no there's no other possible position in this grammar that if we see a B here, there's no other way that we could derive a tree from this except for this production here. Now, how it does that is very clever, but um, we probably won't have time to go into that. But when we see B in the input, this is the only production that could match. You could sort of sit down for yourself and, and convince yourself of that. If it were, if it were this B, then there, there'd have to be some other tokens before that match A. So the only possible production that could be matched is this one. And so now that we've seen B, um, it's going to know that it can reduce. So this is skipping a few steps here, but it'll push B onto the, onto the stack and then it'll recognize that the only possible production that could be matched by B is, a, is capital A. It'll pop that off the stack, construct A, construct a node for it, and push A onto the stack. So now in our input, we haven't just seen A, B, we've seen A and capital symbol A. And so our algorithm is going to know that we're at this point in our production. It's going to be able to deduce that we're here. We've seen A and capital A. So the only possible place in our grammar that we could, could be is here. So then when it reads another input, it knows that it's reading uh, either A or B here. So, so, you know, once we've seen A, once we've seen A followed by A, we're either here or we're here, because this is also after A. Sorry, I misspoke. It's not only here. It's either after, it's after one of these capital A's. That's the only place in our grammar that we could be. So when we see another B in the input, we must conclude that we're in this production. We're inside this production. Because if we're here and we see a lowercase b, there's no way that uppercase b could match that. So the algorithm will effectively reduce that we're here in our input. So since we're here, the next symbol that we must read is a C. So it reads that in. And now on our stack, so it reads in C, and now on our stack we've seen a complete production. We've seen capital A followed by B and C. We've seen capital A followed by B and C. And at this point, what's the operation that the parser does when it sees a complete production? Reduce, reduces the operation, so it pops these elements off the stack and replaces them with the left-hand side of the production. So it pops it off and replaces it with the left-hand side of the production. And so it'll proceed this way, reading in inputs, pushing them onto the stack, <coughs> reducing productions when it, comes, when it knows it comes to the end of production, until at the end, it finally is able to reduce the starting symbol production. Okay, so I went through this slide. I just want to show this sort of intuitively what's happening so you can see what it looks like before we go through an actual example of in detail going through each step of this parser. Uh, but questions on, on this process? Yeah. So 
is totally relevant to the chat GPT uh, to go back and construct another ad. How do you know that second GPT? Construct this ad? Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's more clever than that. Effectively, it's, it's making a state for, it's, it's like the NFA transition. It's keeping a state for every possible position in the grammar. So there are multiple positions in this grammar that you could be in at this point. So you can either be after this A or after this A. It constructs a single state to represent that position in the grammar. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So it's interesting, I can actually go through quickly an example of, of what this looks like. So starting with the starting state, this dot here represents all the possible positions in the grammar we could be as we're recognizing all possible inputs in the language. So this is, this is, the, this is the same grammar. So if we're at the starting symbol here, at the beginning of the starting symbol, um, Oh, sorry. So this, so we construct a, a, a new artificial starting symbol, uh, S0 here. That's at the beginning of um, that. So the algorithm creates a new special starting symbol that goes before matching S. And so if we're at the beginning of matching S, so if we're in a state where we're before seeing S, well, we're also in a state where we're inside matching S. So if we're, we're matching the entirety of S, we're also matching the, the, what's inside S as well. So these two points are, we, we're in these two possible states at the same time, either before seeing an entire S or inside of S. It's kind of, yeah, it's, it's like an epsilon transition where you're in both states at the same time. And so there are only two possible symbols we can see uh, after, after being in these positions. We could either see uh, a, if we're inside of S, or we can see the entire S symbol itself at this point. So if we see the entire S symbol, then we're done. We're at the, we're at the end of, uh, of uh, recognizing this input. If we see an A, then these are all the possible positions we could be in after we see the symbol A. So if we see the symbol A, uh, we're here in production S, but we're also at the beginning of production A, because the next thing that we need to read in to match S is capital A. So we're also inside of matching A. There are two ways to match A. So we're inside the beginning of both matches of A. Does that, does that kind of make sense? So it's, ju yeah, it's just like the epsilon transitions where you, know, you can think of S as kind of being an epsilon transition to its right-hand side, sort of. Um, but, we'll, but yeah, so we're just keeping track of all possible positions we can be in and then seeing all possible inputs, seeing all possible next inputs. And so we just do this process over and over and over again, where uh, here, if we're at the beginning of A, and we see, if we see the entire production A, then where, where, can we, where do we transition to if we see an entire capital A? Well, we'll transition here or here. But if we're here, there's no way, there's no possible transition here. We can only see B here. Uh, if we see lowercase b, there's only one possible transition here from the beginning of production 3 to the end of production 3. So that's reflected here, where if we see a b, we move from this state here into this state. If we see a capital A, we move from these two states to these two states. But transitively, just like with epsilon closure, if we're at the beginning of production b, then we're also inside of the beginning of production B. And so now we have you know, three possible symbols that we can go to next. So yeah, very much like the NFA translation, where we take this closure and we have the same idea, notion of a closure, where we find all possible um, sort of epsilon you know, transitions, and so on. And we build out this uh, set of possible states, and then this is what we use to construct the tables. So whenever we transition on a terminal in the language, that's a shift. That says we read in that uh, symbol and then we move on to the next state. Whenever we see, um, 
whenever we're whenever on the state we see a uh, uh, a potential to read in an entire construct, then we we reduce instead of shift. We reduce at that point, and so the reduce action will pop off the states that correspond to these symbols and replace them with a new state. So it sort of makes sense. So the, the algorithm is much more kind of nitpicky when you actually go to do this algorithm. It's it's a little a little painful to, a little painful to do. Um, but what we end up with is two tables. Uh, so anyway, well let me let me go into an actual example, the actual example for homework. So that'll be that'll be more relevant. So what we end up with is let me uh, let me see if I can lay this out. That's not a great layout. Um, Okay, this is probably easier to see. So what we end up with is two tables. One table for the terminals in the language and one table for the non-terminals. So the, the, the state transitions for the non-terminals and the state transitions for the terminals were taken from that, that derivation of, of all possible states from all possible symbols. Um, and you know, without going into like excruciating detail about how it works, from that set of states, you can determine whether you need to read in uh, another token in order to continue parsing a production, or whether you've reached the end of a of a of a production. So in our in our table here, in our uh, set of states here, there are some productions like here, here, and here. There are some positions where we know we're at the end of a production. And so that's where we do our reduce actions. So all the states we're in where we're at the end of a production. In our table, we say do a reduce here because we know we've seen an end of a reduction. If we're in the middle of some production, then in our table, we put shift in order to tell it to continue reading. Now, for the places where we, we've seen an entire non terminal, the transition tape, the reductions work in tandem with the transitions past the non-terminals in order to both reduce and then move past and consume the entire non-terminal. So that, that's a little hard to just explain, but let me show you, let, let me just get to the algorithm and show you how that works together. So effectively we've got to shift, 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 shift until we reduce, and then once we, re once we reduce we've seen the entire non-terminal and then we go to the non-terminal state transition diagram to tell us how to consume that non-terminal and what state to go into next. That's what this go-to table does. All right, so let's just do it. So first, here's our grammar. Here's our grammar. And as an example, I'd like, uh, uh, let's see, I'll use um, CCD, I think was the in-class example I was going to use. So convince yourself that CCD matches. So A is the starting symbol. There are two possibilities, A, capital A, B, or V. Um, And so V, uh, the starting symbol can just reduce to V. Um, v can start with C and be followed by another V, whereas V can be D by itself. So CCD, let me actually show the parse tree for this, for CCD. So if CCD is my input, then I can derive this by matching, taking the production that uh, reduces A to V, or produces V from A, and then V can either be CV, or D. So this is production V goes to D. This is production, 
Let me write this in red here. So this is the production that is VD. This is the production CV here. This is also the production C followed by V. And this is the production A, V. Questions on this, this derivation? So if, if I if I apply this production rule, I get V as a child. If I apply this production rule, I get C V. I have another V here, so if I apply this production rule, C V again, I get C V. And with this V here, if I put I this production rule, I get V goes to D. So let's see how we can use this table in order to automatically derive that parse tree. So it looks a little daunting at first, but the, uh, the rules are simple, almost too simple. That, that's really what makes these kind of algorithms so fiddly, is that they're extremely simplistic. <laughs> they don't give you any, any, any help in understanding how or why they work. So there's our table, and let's set up our parse. So we've got our input. This arrow is the current input that we are looking at, our look ahead. We've got a stack. This is our stack. This is our input. And here's where I'll construct our tree. OK, so every, um, every parser has a starting symbol. So by convention, I think I said in the exercise that it's 0 is the starting symbol. Can also, I also just put it in the first row. So 0 is our starting symbol. And so just like with the DFA, we look at our starting, we look at our state, our top, we look at our state on the stack, and we look at our look ahead, and we go to our table and say, all right, what action is it telling us to do? So in state zero, we see C, so what action is this table telling us to do? Shift three, right. So let me take a record. I'll take a record of our actions here as well. So shift three. So what shift three will do is it'll put the symbol on the stack along with the state that we transitioned into. And that's one element on the stack. So we save the symbol and we record its state. Strictly speaking, you don't actually have to record the um, symbol, but it's used to uh, it's used in Bison to help you generate the parse tree. So we've seen C, and here's our tree. So this is our tree node for C. All right, questions on this so far? Yeah. Three is from the symbol ta uh, the, the state table. So we're in state zero, and we see C in the input. So shift three means read C from the input, put C and the new state on the stack. So that's shift three. So we got this from the, we get the actions from the table. Shift tells us, consume the input and put the, the symbol and the new state on the stack. So shift is what gives us our leaves. So I started constructing our tree with the leaves. OK, and then we do the same procedure. We look at the state on the stack. We look at our look ahead. We go to our table. And we're in state 3, and we see C. 
Looking at our table, we're in state three, and we see the letter C. What do we do? Shift three. So here's our next action, shift three. So how do we execute a shift? We consume the input. And we actually, so one way to look at this is we actually move this onto the stack and record the next state. Okay, good. So now we're in state three and we see D in the input. So looking at our table, what do we do when we're in state three and we see D in the input? Good, shift six. Shift six. So shift tells us to consume the input, put it on the stack, record the state, and now we are in so as a convention, we just have an end of end of input symbol. So we're on the end of input. And we've you know we've read in these three symbols. We're at the end of our input, we're in state six. So in state six, we see the end of the input. Here's end of input, the column for it. We're in state six. So what action do we take? Reduce four. Okay. So Unlike shift, that four is referring to which production we've just recognized. So remember, reduce is, the, is when the machine recognizes that we've reached the end of a production. So these productions, uh, I'll renumber these. So they're numbered one, two, three, four. This is the fourth production. So this is the production that we reduce. So here's the action, reduce four, which is V goes to D. And so the way reduce works is we take all of the number of symbols on the right-hand side and pop the corresponding number from the stack. So we've recognized this right-hand side, so we pop that right-hand side off the stack. So this gets popped off the stack. And instead, we push the right-hand side onto the stack. So we push V now onto the stack, because we recognize its right-hand side, so we replace its right-hand side with the left-hand side. We can record that fact in the tree by making V the parent node of whatever nodes we had in the stack. Okay, so now in order to figure out what state we go to next, we have just a symbol on the stack, but we also have a preceding state still. So we're back in state three, but instead of seeing D, we've seen an entire non-terminal at this point. So this is where the go-to table comes in. It's the transition table for non-terminals. So if we're in state three, so here we're in state three, and we see V in the input, what action do we take? Go to four. So go to four is just transition. It's just a state transition. Oh, sorry, five, five. Sorry, yeah, it's five, it's five. We're in state three, and we see four. That could have been bad. So our action that we take now is go to five, right? Go to five. And so all go to does is it just puts the new state on the stack. So go to five says put the next state on the stack. So this is the state transition. So once we reduce, we remove all the symbols from the stack that were on the right-hand side and replace it with its left-hand side, which is exactly a bottom-up tree traversal. And then that state transition table for the non-terminals is what gives us a way to figure out what the next state is. All right, so we're in state five, and our input is still on the end terminal. 
So what do we do? How do we know what to do next? Well, in stage five, we see the end symbol. So what do we do next? Yeah. Reduce three, because we're in state five, we see the end symbol, and so we just follow the table and say, all right, reduce three. So three is this production here, V equals CV. So our action is reduce three, and that's this production. So let's see reduce again. So reduce works by taking these symbols off the state stack, the right-hand side symbols, which are here, C and V, popping them off the stack and replacing them with the parent. Oh, sorry, it's not CV, it's CV, CV. Sorry about that. So we pop these two symbols off the stack and replace it with its parent. These get popped off the stack and replaced with the parent node. And corresponding to that reduce action, we can construct a new parse tree node that records how this grammar is derived. Okay, so after reduce, we now have our non-terminal symbol on the stack and our we know what's, what state we're in previously. We go back to that state. And so how do we know what state to go to next? We look at the go-to table. So we're in state three now, and we've seen V. So we go to five again. So our action is go to five. And so go to is just the state transition table for non-terminals. And that puts us in state five. Okay. All right, so in state five, and our look ahead symbol is still the end of the input. So if we're in state five, and we see end of input, what do we do? We reduce three, right? So let's do the reduction again. And so reduce takes the right-hand side symbols, pops them off the stack, and replaces it with the left-hand side. And so how do we figure out which state, and you know, we can make the corresponding tree node for it. So how do we figure out what next state to go into? The go-to table, yeah, I think I heard, heard someone say it. So the go-to table. So, so now we're back in state zero, because if you look at our stack, we're now in state zero. That's the last state we had in our stack. And we've seen an entire V production. Looking at our table, if we're in state zero and we see V, that's a little hard to read, but that's go to four. So that tells us that our next action is go to four. So that becomes our new state on the stack. And again, we're in state four, and we're still on the, the uh, end terminal, or the end token. So if we're in state four, and we see the end terminal, yeah, reduce two is our, is our action. So reduce two, and two was this. If we look at our second production, it's that. And so how do we reduce? What does reduce do? What's the procedure for reduce? Yeah, pop the right-hand side. So we pop the right-hand side. There's only one element on the right-hand side. 
pop it off, and replace it with its left-hand side, which is A. And then how do we determine the next state to go into? We look at the go-to table, so on state zero, and we've seen A, which is mislabeled, I will, I will fix this. And so on state zero, we go to state one, go to one, and if we're in state one, and we've seen the end sentinel of the input, then we accept. And so each, re each reduce will construct this tree. You can record the re reduction in the tree. And so, there we go. So we, and then we, you know, our next transition is, or our next action is accept. Going from state one, seeing this symbol. I know that's like super tedious. Uh, questions? Yeah. Uh, sorry, so this right. How is the table generated? Oh, yeah, so that's the. You can check out these slides. So it's generated from this process here where we go through every point in the grammar, figure out a state to represent that point in the grammar, and then if we see a transition from a terminal, that's a shift. If we see a transition from a non-terminal, that's a reduce. That's how the table is generated. So you won't have to do that. It's it's definitely complicated. Um, but talk to me if you'd like more and more. It's 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 kind of a fun algorithm. Other questions? We had another question. Oh yeah. Uh, the the look ahead is now going to the next character in the input. So if it, if it never gets shifted, then it never gets put on the stack. So the end symbol, the, yeah, so the way, the, the, way the, the table will be generated is, you know, it'll, it'll never consume the end symbol. It'll just be used to, it'll, it's, it's constructed from here, actually. So you put it after, that's why you have this special start symbol, this new start symbol. So you can put this symbol here and just always make this the accept state. So that it'll, it'll never get consumed because there's no any, there's no transitions using, using the, the end symbol. Kind of, it's just a little like conceptual trick. All right, looks like you guys are getting out of here. So, have a good weekend. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Um, go on, go to lab and uh, come off hours if you have questions about this. And take care.